readings. So, we got the energies of the hydrogen atom without using the Schrodinger equation. We got the 1 over n square and we were able to do a lot more than what we could with the Schrodinger equation, because the Schrodinger equation would lead us to a situation which we could not reconcile with the degeneracy that we find in the hydrogen atom. right? So, the Schrodinger equation consequence could at best be dealt with by referring to the degeneracy as accidental degeneracy. But when you understand the symmetry of the hydrogen atom, recognize that it is SO4 and symmetry and degeneracy goes together. You know what you do in perturbation theory that you apply a perturbation and the perturbation removes the degeneracy sometimes partially, sometimes wholly that is a matter of detail. We will certainly come back to that when we discuss atomic spectroscopy, but typically a perturbation removes the degeneracy. And the presence of degeneracy suggests that there is some symmetry which you can break as you do in the Zeeman effect for example, you apply a magnetic field. So, you break this spherical symmetry, right? so things are different along one direction. So, symmetry and degeneracy go together and when you recognize the complete symmetry of the hydrogen atom, which is the SO4, you are able to explain the energy spectrum of the hydrogen atom and also the degeneracy. Now, the Casimir operator which you have on the screen C 1 and C 2, uh, it is not such a big you know surprise that the Casimir operators are i square plus k square and i square minus k square, because we do know from Raka's theorem that the number of Casimir operators is equal to the rank. So, we have some something to begin with. We also know this is in response to your question Vivek yesterday. You also know that from Raka's theorem that a suitable bilinear construct of the generators would give you the Casimir. So, the generators are the angular momentum and the poly lens vector operators. So, you construct the bilinear out of it. So, you they have to come out of L square and A square and that is what you find over here. Okay. So, we you have some sort of clue to go about discovering these Casimir operators and you can get it readily. So, uh, these i and k are the pseudo angular momentum vector operators i and k are independent. So, they commute with each other and from angular momentum algebra and some of this we are going to do in unit 2, we will ensure that these quantum numbers can be either 0, half, 1, 3 half and so on, but I have anticipated that result you have met this result earlier in some other course presumably. So, I have used it, but we will establish it in some details when we do unit 2, we will actually prove that angular momentum quantum numbers can be only 0, half, 1 and so on. Okay. So, these are the uh, pseudo angular momentum uh, operators as I mentioned yesterday. We have the degeneracy over here which goes as n square, this was the mystery which we wanted to explain for the hydrogen atom. And if you see what the degenerate functions are, so, for n equal to 2, you have a fourfold degeneracy and these of course, are the four linearly independent wave functions, which all belong to the same eigenvalue. Okay. This is then doubled because of spin, but without spin this is a fourfold degeneracy. So, for n equal to 2, these are the four, for 3 you have additional 5 orbitals which are degenerate, these are the 5 orbitals with the d symmetry. Okay, the 3 d wave functions, there are 5 linearly independent functions with d symmetry and these 5 get added to the earlier 4, which are the s and p and you get a 9 fold degeneracy for n equal to 3, for n equal to 4 you get an additional 7 fold degeneracy coming from the 4 f orbitals. Okay. So, this is how it will go and as n increases the degeneracy will increase as the square of n. Now, for the Rydberg-Balmer formula, 
we put kappa equal to E square. You notice that 2 s and 2 p are degenerate which is rather surprising because these wave functions have opposite parity. One is even the other is odd. The parity is given by the L quantum number okay. and under inversion these wave functions under parity you know they, they have the parity of the L quantum number and usually you do not have degeneracy between uh, functions of opposite parity. In this case you have which is a rather uh, peculiar result and this we now understand very easily because we are dealing with a mix of L and A. One is a polar vector, the other is an axial vector. Okay? That is the reason parity is not a good quantum number in this case. So, these are some of the references which I would like to suggest. There is a very nice article by Burkhardt and Leventhal, which was first published in the American Journal of Physics in 2004, and subsequently, you know, they also published a book which is uh, published by Springer Forlock, and this is a very nice reference um, for the lens vector uh, properties of the hydrogen atom. This is a good reference, but then I will also like to suggest that the usual books in quantum mechanics Schiff, Messiah, Arno Bohm, okay, not David Bohm, his son Arno Bohm has got a book on quantum mechanics and uh, Greiner's book, Lando Lifshitz, they all have this and you can refer to any one of these. So, you are going to find the, the main results that we have discussed in all of these sources. Okay, now, let us consider various atomic systems. An atomic, when I talk about an atomic system, I also include an ion, which is also an atomic system. Okay? And typically in a neutral atom, you will have z number of protons in the nucleus, you will have n number of electrons in the atom. In the neutral atom, z is equal to n, but n could be less or more. In negative ions, n could be more than z, and in positive ions, n can be less than z and in highly charged ions n can be lot less than z. And in stellar space you do have extremely highly charged ions you know you have iron which is stripped out of its electrons and you are left with very few electrons with the iron nucleus. And there are so many other uh, species of this kind and depending on the number of electrons n is either equal to z or not equal to z and this z minus n could be 0, if n is equal to z. And as r tends to infinity, the potential will go as 1 over r, if n is equal to z. But if n is not equal to z, it will go by not just 1 over r, but by z minus n plus 1 over r, as r tends to infinity. Whereas, as r tends to 0, the potential will go as minus z over r. So, if you look at this curve here. There, there are two lines over here, one is a blue curve which is minus 1 over r. This is the typical hydrogen atom curve, you have just plotted minus 1 over r. And as r tends to infinity, the red curve which is the potential seen by an electron in an atom which is not just the hydrogen atom, it could be you know have more than one electron and this curve will go to 0 as minus z over r. So, which means that this will fall below the blue line okay? and that is what makes the potential in other atoms not hydrogenic strictly. So, the potential is not strictly minus 1 over r in the entire region of space and then the SO 4 symmetry is broken for these atoms. Okay? The nature of the potential you know it, it is right on top of the 1 over r only in the asymptotic infinite r tending to infinity region, but not elsewhere. So, uh, some of these uh, things lead to corrections, the 1 over n square formula needs to be corrected, it becomes 1 over n minus mu square, okay. because of this, because the potential is different from minus 1 over r in the core as r tends to 0 you have a correction and this is sometimes referred to as a quantum defect. 
So, the mu that you see which is the correction to the principal quantum number, the energies do not go strictly as 1 over n square, but the energies and other atoms other than the hydrogen atom, they go as 1 over n minus mu square, where mu is called as a quantum defect. And this was earlier introduced semi empirically, but then you get it nicely from uh, quantum mechanics and this was done by Mike Seaton and Fano and so on. So, there is a whole formalism which is known as a quantum defect theory. Uh, I might touch upon some of the applications at a later point of in this course, but in these atoms because there is a quantum defect mu and this quantum defect depends on the L quantum number. This is what makes the energy of 2 s different from the energy of 2 p. This is what happens in sodium atom and all the other atoms. Okay. In hydrogen atom 2 s and 2 p will be at the same energy, 3 s, 3 p, 3 d will be at the same energy, but that is not the case in other atoms. In other atoms depending on the L quantum number, so the energy depends not just on the principal quantum number as it does for the hydrogen atom, but also on the orbital angular momentum quantum number L for all the other atoms. Now, there are further considerations and uh, we will just anticipate some of these things. When you do the relativistic hydrogen atom, which is what we will discuss in unit 3, you will find that states with different L, but if they have the same J quantum number, they are degenerate, but then there is a spin orbit you know splitting because of the relativistic interaction. So, these are some of the details that we will meet when we do unit 3. So, the complete story of the hydrogen atom is quite rich and we have just got a bare introduction to the non relativistic hydrogen atom spectrum and its degeneracy. Not only that, the there is a further difference between the 2 p 1 half and the 2 s 1 half, this is known as a lamp shift and these are you know these come from you know uh, field theoretical corrections. So, the story of the hydrogen atom is really very involved and quite challenging. So, these are some of the things that uh, you will meet. Uh, the then there is the hyperfine structure which comes from coupling between the electron spin and the nuclear spin. So, so you know depending on the level at which you are studying the hydrogen atom, you do have a very complex spectrum. So, we will talk about these things maybe in a little, little later part of the course. Now, let us have a look at these wave functions and again I am not going to discuss how you derive these solutions from the Schrodinger equation. All of you have done a first course in quantum mechanics, you have done the hydrogen atom, you have applied the boundary conditions to the radial part and you have actually obtained the, these solutions. So, I take that you are familiar with these solutions. Okay. Now, you obtain these radial functions by solving the Schrodinger equation and applying appropriate boundary conditions. Right? So, these results are known. What we are going to do now is discover that these solutions can be obtained not just from the Schrodinger equation as you have already done in your earlier course in quantum mechanics, but you can get these wave functions also from the poly lens vector. Okay. So, we will carry the potential of the poly lens vector further and we begin with this equivalent form of the poly lens quantum mechanical vector and we will use this poly lens vector to get the hydrogen atom wave functions. So, let us see how to do that. Let us first of all define a ground state. The ground state has the principal quantum number n equal to 1, n we have introduced as 2 i plus 1. right? So, this corresponds to i equal to 0 and we do this bookkeeping by designating this vector in the Hilbert space by the principal quantum number. This is our designation of the ground state. Uh, we have to find what this is. We have to find its coordinate representation. Okay. We had done it from the Schrodinger equation. We will now do it from the poly lens vector. So, given the fact that n is equal to 1, we know that the corresponding value of i must be 0 and therefore, if the vector operator i were to operate 
on this ground state you will get 0 and the same thing would happen if you were to operate by the other pseudo angular momentum vector operator k. Okay? So, you will get 0 out of this operation. Now, L and A the angular momentum and the poly lens operators they are made up of the sum and the difference of i and k. And since i and k each gives you 0, L operating on the ground state will give you 0 and A prime the poly lens operator operating on the ground state would also give you 0, it is quite straightforward. Now, A prime is proportional to the poly lens operator, right. We had only defined A prime through that scaling factor if you remember. So, obviously, when the poly lens operator operates on the ground state, the result is 0. Now, this is very good, because we do have an explicit form of the poly lens vector operator, which is this. So, let us write this expression with the complete form of the poly lens vector operator, which is this operating on the ground state and the result is 0. The, the first term has got the angular momentum operator, which is the first one which would operate on the vector. And we have already seen that when the angular momentum operator operates on the ground state, you must get 0. We just saw it, right. So, L operating on 1 on the ground state would give you 0. So, out of the three terms that you find in the bracket, the first one would give you 0 you have only the other two both with a minus sign. So, you can write the remaining two terms which is i h cross p plus mu kappa r the unit vector r, but I have changed the sign. Why? Minus 1 into 0 is still equal to 0 even in atomic physics, right. So, this will work. Okay. Now, we know what the momentum operator is, this is our expression, momentum is the gradient operator. So, plug it in, momentum is minus i h cross gradient and now you have a differential equation. Okay. You have a first order differential equation and it is no big problem to solve it, all of you can do it. Right. So, you have a first order differential equation, which is h cross square gradient plus mu epsilon square operating on the ground state equal to 0. This is obviously not the Schrodinger equation, the operator is not the Hamiltonian, it does not have the kinetic energy, it does not have the potential energy. The kinetic energy goes as the square of the gradient operator, right, p square. This is the first order differential equation. Schrodinger equation is a second order differential equation, this is not the Schrodinger equation, this is the first order differential equation that you are getting by exploiting the properties of the poly lens vector operator. And all you have to do is to solve this first order differential equation, which will give you the ground state, the coordinate representation of the state vector 1 will give you the ground state wave function psi. right? and the solution is what you have seen earlier already, but you had got it from the Schrodinger equation and we get it now without touching the Schrodinger equation. And a question which I had posed toward the end of our previous class was that we get the energy eigenvalues of the hydrogen atom and now you have seen that you get also the wave functions and in fact if you do this if you extend this technique further you can get not just the one s wave function but all of them okay that involves a little extensive algebraic methods which i will not discuss in the class but you can go through masaya's quantum mechanics and you will find the discussion over there so i'm not going to discuss that but we have shown how you can get the ground state wave function all the other wave functions can also be obtained using similar techniques. And the interesting feature is that you get the energy eigenspectrum, 
the eigenvalues, you also get the wave functions. You are able to do more with this, because you are able to explain the degeneracy of the hydrogen atom, which you could not otherwise, but you have not used the Schrodinger equation. So, how is it that you get all the results of quantum mechanics without using the Schrodinger equation? Do you recognize that you have not used the Schrodinger equation, and you do get the complete energy spectrum, the Eigen spectrum, the Eigen values, the Eigen functions and the degeneracy and everything. Now, the answer lies in the fact that Schrodinger equation is a representation of quantum mechanics. So, whenever we ask this question as to what is it that you mean by quantization, does it mean that you replace the classical equation of motion by the Schrodinger equation. Okay? And the Schrodinger equation is not just h psi equal to e psi, that is only the time independent part. Okay? Basically, it is a rate equation, it gives you the rate at which the wave function changes with time, del psi by del t. Okay? So, it tells you how the state of a system evolves with time, that is the fundamental question in mechanics. How do you represent the state of a system? and how does the system evolve with time. And the rate equation is given by the Schrodinger equation for del psi by del t. But the heart of quantum mechanics is in the fact that you need to perform a measurement. Unless you are able to carry out a measurement, you cannot relate your theory to your observations. And in classical mechanics, you do it by measuring the position and the momentum. And without this measurement, you do not get the state of the system. The state of a system in classical mechanics is denoted by q and p, it is a point in the phase space. Okay? So, q and p give you the state of a system in classical mechanics. And this is possible, because simultaneous measurements of position and momentum are not challenged in this approximation. It is not that they are possible, but they are not challenged. They are of course, not possible, because you try to do it and you meet incompatibility. You try to make a measurement of position, then you do a measurement of momentum, come back and measure the position, you do not recover the same answer as you did earlier. So, repeated measurements do not give you same results. So, these operators do not commute, they do not have simultaneous eigenstates. And then you have to abandon the rate equations, which are the Hamilton's equations q dot and p dot. Okay? Equivalently, the Lagrange's equations or Newton's, it is the same thing. But essentially, you are looking for rate equations as to how a system evolves with time. And you have to abandon that scheme and replace classical dynamical variables by judicious operators, that is quantization. It is not just having discrete energy states or anything like that that is quantization. And that is something we have certainly used in our poly lens vector analysis. Okay? The essence of quantum mechanics is that, we have taken full advantage of that in our treatment of the poly lens vector, which is why we are able to get all the results of quantum mechanics, because they are contained in the heart of quantum mechanics, which is quantization. So, we did not use the Schrodinger equation, but we get all the results. So, uh, these are this is the 1 s wave function, which you know goes as e to the minus r. And then likewise, you can do a little more you know analysis, and you can recover the entire range of radial functions of the hydrogen atom. You can get 1 s, 2 s, 2 p, 3 s, just about everything. The entire range of eigenfunctions you will get using this treatment. So, I would like to remind that the Schrodinger equation is not just h psi equal to e psi, it is rather the rate equation at which the state of a system evolves with time, because the whole idea is this, that you want to see how a state of a quantum system evolves with time. So, there has to be a time derivative operator, which must show up. So, that is what the Schrodinger equation is about. 
Then of course, when you have stationary state solutions, you can get the um, time independent differential equation and depending on the symmetry, when there is a spherical symmetry, you separate the radial part and the angular part and all of this machinery of the Schrodinger equation, it is a very powerful you know, machinery and there is a lot that one learns out of it. And since you have already done a course in quantum mechanics in which you have done worked out these details, I am not going to repeat any of that, but I will nevertheless touch upon a few points, just a selection of a few points of those properties which I think are rather interesting in atomic physics. So, I am going to refer to the Schrodinger equation now, exploit the radial uh, the spherical symmetry and then look at the radial differential equation. This is the one dimensional radial differential equation that you get after you remove the spherical part, the, the angular part. Okay. And I would like to discuss this for any form of the spherical potential for which r square v goes to 0. Now, this includes the Coulomb potential because r square v goes as 1 over r. So, r square v will go as r and r tends to 0, it goes to 0. So, for any potential which goes to 0 as r tends to 0 and then look at the nature of these solutions in this limit. Now, r square v goes to 0. So, if you look at the small r behavior and this is always nice to do when you are dealing with differential equations, does not matter whether it is in physics or any, any other subject, try to see what you can get in different limiting conditions. Like how does the differential equation look like in the r tending to 0 region? How does it look like in the r tending to infinity region? Do you get some special features? And you can get a lot of insight into the subject by doing this. So, as r tends to 0, if you look at the last term, you have got r square multiplying e, the energy and no matter what energy is. Okay. It could be the energy of the 1 s state or the 2 s, the 3 p or 15 g whatever okay. or it could be a continuum. It could be a positive energy in the continuum, it does not matter. No matter what energy is, r square into e will go to 0 as r tends to 0. And by our choice of the potential that r square v goes to 0 as r tends to 0, the second term over here this one also goes to 0, which means that in your differential equation, this entire thing can be struck off. If you want to get some idea about what is the nature of the solutions in the small r region. Okay. And what is interesting is that whatever you will learn from the residual differential equation is going to be common for all the energies. It does not matter whether you are dealing with discrete part of the spectrum with negative energies, positive energies, which quantum number n equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, it does not matter, because our consideration is completely independent of the energy. So, for this, the residual differential equation consists of only the first two terms and we write this differential equation here. This is the residual differential equation, which is of relevance for the small r region. This is not going to give us the complete solution for the entire domain of space from 0 through infinity, but it will give us some insight into the nature of the solutions in the small r region, and that is very important. It of course, it does not depend on the azimuthal quantum number m either, it does not appear anywhere, it is independent of E. And if you seek a power series solution, then you can plug in this form of the power series solution over here, take the first derivative, take, take the second derivative and immediately you are led to the condition that this radial function as r tends to 0 must go as the lth power of r. Now, this is a very important result, it has got very important consequences in atomic processes in collision, in quantum collisions and so on. You will see why it is of such importance. Let us try to sketch this behavior. In the smaller region, do not think of this line as 
a line of significant length, because we are really looking at we are what we are discussing is the nature of the solutions as r tends to 0. So, it is in the infinitesimally small region close to r equal to 0 that you are examining the nature of the solutions. And that is what I indicate on the vertical axis that this is the radial function near the origin. And we know that the solution goes as r to the l. So, for l equal to 0 it will be constant r to the 0 is 1. So, there will be some normalization constant etcetera right. So, it will be constant as r tends to 0. For l equal to 1 which is for the p wave from p waves right l equal to 0 are the s waves. For the p waves this is r to the 1. So, it will be linear right. For l equal to 2 you will have parabolic behavior and for l equal to 3 it will go as r to the 3 and what you notice over here that as l increases it goes to 0 much faster. Okay. And this should not surprise you, because if you look at the one dimensional radial Schrodinger equation, you have an effective potential which is made up of this part and this term over here, which is l into l plus 1 by r square. You remember this term, you got it when you separated the angular part from the radial part. Okay. This l into l plus 1 by r square term is called as the centrifugal term. Why is it centrifugal? what does the term centrifugal suggest to us? Centrifugal term is what you use in classical mechanics when you are dealing with pseudo forces. right? So, there is something unreal about it and what is unreal about this term is that this is not a real physical potential. The physical potential that you have in the hydrogen atom is just the electromagnetic potential which is the coulomb 1 over r. right? That is the physical potential. Here the effective potential is the coulomb potential plus an additional term which is not physics, it is coming from a mathematical artifact, because you have reduced the three dimensional problem to a one dimensional problem. Okay. So, it is a mathematical artifact of the reduction of the three dimensional potential to the one dimensional problem that you have this term, it is not a physical potential. So, that is what makes it a pseudo potential kind of thing. Okay. So, it is called as a centrifugal term, because it is not really physical. The other thing it has in common with the centrifugal term is that what the centrifugal term does in classical mechanics when you are dealing with rotating frames of references is to keep an object out. Right? The centrifugal force keeps an object out away, that is exactly what you see over here that as l increases, l into l plus 1 by r square term becomes more and more important. And the probability amplitude of the wave function goes to 0 much faster in the smaller region as l increases. So, as l equal to 0, s wave is not at all, it is it has an amplitude at r equal to 0, because the centrifugal term is 0. But then whenever L is greater than 0, whether it is 1, 2, 3 or whatever, the wave function is not able to reach the center. The corresponding probability amplitude, the probability density and the electron itself will be kept away. So, if you have a collision experiment for example, you have got a target, you bombard electrons then electrons with higher angular momentum, they will not really be able to get into the core, they will be kept away. So, it has got consequences in quantum collisions, we will be discussing some of these uh, applications later, but it is important to recognize that these properties come from the small r behavior of the wave function, which goes as r to the l. So, this is the centrifugal term. Let us now deal with v equal to 0 case, 
like I mentioned that whenever you look at a differential equation it is always interesting to look at it in different limiting conditions. So, you can look at r equal to 0 r going to infinity you can also look for a limiting behavior of the potential v equal to 0 is also a central field potential because it has got the same value in every angle no matter in which direction you look it is always the same which is 0. So, this is an isotropic potential. So, we consider the central field problem with a special case when v is equal to 0. When there is no potential you already know what the solutions are you have done the problem for a free particle the solution is e to the i k dot r right these are the plane waves. So, you already know the solutions you also know that these are not bound particles which is why we call them as free not because you do not pay anything for it, but just because they are not bound anywhere right. So, it is a free particle you know that the energy is positive they belong to the continuum and the solution goes as e to the i k dot r and you can choose an axis along k. So, uh, you can get uh, the k dot r term to be uh, given by k z. And now let us throw the term v. You know that these are also eigenstates of L square, which is the square of the angular momentum, right. Now put v equal to 0 in the radial Schrodinger equation. So v is gone, you are left with 2me by h cross square, and you can define the wave vector in terms of that, which is p over h cross, okay. So, the 2 m e over h cross square is replaced by this k square in the differential equation ok. And now, you have a differential equation in which v does not appear and it is still the Schrodinger equation for the hydrogen atom for the special case when you are dealing with a limiting behavior v going to 0. So, let us have a look at the nature of the solution. Now, what is interesting about it is how do you normalize it, because when you construct the normalization integral you integrate psi star psi over the whole space and that is what gives you the normalization integral right. Now, what is going to happen if you have for the wave function e to the i k z, you have e to the i k z multiplied by e to the minus i k z that gives you 1 and then you are adding the volume element over the whole space ok. So, it blows up it just blows up and this is not square integrable this is not normalizable. So, how do you normalize it? So, we have to figure out how to normalize it and these are normalized using a technique known as the Dirac delta normalization ok. Now, you have probably met the delta function and the normalization is achieved through this expression over here that you normalize this integral by setting it equal to the orthogonality between L and L prime and M and M prime this is coming from the orthogonality of the spherical harmonics. So, this is not new to us that is not what I am going to discuss, but the radial part will have to be normalized because the trouble is coming from the radial part of the solution. So, the radial part of the solution is normalized on the k over 2 pi scale this is called as the Dirac delta normalization ok. And this integral 0 through infinity of the radial integral is set equal to the Dirac delta this is not the Kronecker delta ok this is the Dirac delta and the Dirac delta is a very interesting function it has got marvelous applications when you are dealing with continuum functions, because continuum functions you are always going to have to deal with in quantum collision theory. So, the discrete spectra which are square integrable uh, they are um, only part of quantum mechanics, but then the remaining part of quantum mechanics which deals with you know the continuum states you have to normalize them using the Dirac delta functions and uh, it has some similarity with the charge density, 
which is charge per unit volume in the limit the volume element going to 0. Now, when the volume element going goes to 0, both the numerator and the denominator would individually vanish, right, but the ratio does not and the Dirac delta function has got properties of this kind. So, uh, this is the definition of the Dirac delta function, you probably have met it in your mathematical physics course and uh, what it does is it has got a spike when the argument of the function is 0, okay. that is the spiked function. There are various representations of the Dirac delta function, always remember that it has got dimensions it must have the dimensions of 1 over x, okay, whatever be the argument of the delta function. So, do not ignore the dimensions of the Dirac delta and uh, what it does is that you can you know reduce the width and let the height increase of a rectangle, but the area which is the product of one side with the other that area remains the same and you can keep doing it and decrease the width let it become infinitesimally small and let this height becomes infinitesimally large. So, it does develop a spike. This is not the only representation, there are many other representations of Dirac delta function. Okay. All of them have got this special feature, they are all spiked, okay. they have got a huge height in the middle and then it dies off very fast. And sometimes I like to call this as an expert function, because it reminds me of what an expert is. An expert is one who knows more and more about less and less, right. In the limit, he knows everything about nothing, okay. So, sometimes I call the Dirac delta function as expert function, but you understand why it is, it has this behavior. And I will like to draw your attention to Arfkin's book, Arfkin and Weber, and you will find the properties of Dirac delta and some very good exercises. I strongly recommend Arfkin for this. Now, you can define this Dirac delta normalization. Okay. Now, notice that the dummy variable here, which is being integrated out is f okay. and the quantum state is represented by f over here and you integrate this out and you get the Dirac delta normalization. Lando and Lifshitz is also a very good source for this, especially for the normalization of the continuum functions. Now, if you multiply the argument by one factor, by a scaling factor like alpha, then the Dirac delta gets scaled by 1 over modulus of alpha and some of these properties are probably known to you or if you look into Arfkin's book, you will find uh, that these are simple exercises, which are based on the properties of the Dirac delta. What it means that if you now normalize this, not with reference to the state f, but you describe it in terms of a function of f like phi of f. Okay. What I have in mind is the energy parameter energy is p square over 2 m, right. So, I can normalize the wave functions on the energy scale, I can also normalize it on the p scale on the momentum scale. The corresponding wave functions will have to be related, they have to be scaled appropriately and the scaling will come from this relation, because the Dirac delta for alpha x is related to delta of x by this relation over here. Okay. So, if it is normalized on the phi scale rather than f scale, where phi is a function of f. So, f can be your k and p is a function of k, e is also a function of k, e is p square over 2 m or it is h cross square k square over 2 m. right? So, you can write this the index either as energy or as momentum or as k, which is a wave number. And depending on which you are using, you will have a Dirac delta, which is now the difference of phi f prime minus phi. And this comes from ordinary calculus, 
that this will be delta f prime minus f divided by this modulus of this, this the same relation that I am writing here. So, some of these things we will have to work with when we advance this course to deal with continuum physics with collision quantum collision physics. So, we will come back to this, but I just thought that I will alert you to some of these properties for now. So, this is the normalization on the k over 2 pi scale, this is the normalization on the energy scale and the relationship between the two is given by this scaling factor. So, uh, the normalization if r e l is the radial function which is normalized on the energy scale, it is related to the radial function which is normalized on the k over 2 pi scale through this relation. Okay, this is a very simple algebra and it comes straight from the property of the Dirac delta function. So, let us see what is the nature of the function in the asymptotic region. The solutions we know are e to the i k k dot r or okay. So, these are sinusoidal functions. These are given by the spherical Bessel functions and if you look at the nature of the solution in r tending to infinity region, you have got this derivative operator operating on sin. So, for l equal to 0, this operator operating uh, raised to the power 0 will be unity, it will be the unit operator and you have the solution sin wave, right, which is a sinusoidal wave. As l increases, you will have the derivative operator operating on sin over sin k r over r. Now, what is the derivative of sin k r over r? You will get a term in 1 over r square and another term in 1 over r. The 1 over r square term will go to 0 faster than the 1 over r as r tends to infinity, right. So, you can throw the 1 over r square term, take the leading term. The leading term which goes as 1 over r, r will be the derivative of the sine function which is the cosine and what is the cosine function? It is just the sine function which is phase shifted by pi, pi by 2, right. The cosine function is exactly the same as the sine function, it is only phase shifted by pi by 2. So, every time you have the L quantum number go up by 1 from 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4, okay. every time this happens, you are going to have an extra phase shift by L times pi by 2. That is the nature of the solution as r tends to infinity. Now, this is the nature of the solution for a very special case of the hydrogen atom which is v equal to 0. These are the continuum functions, the free particle solutions. Okay. Now, what would happen if the potential were not 0? You stick in a potential. So, there is a target, it could be the hydrogen atom itself, it could be any other atom. Ignoring terms of the order 1 over r square, the nature of the solution is a sinusoidal wave whose argument is k r phase shifted by pi by 2 l times, okay, because every time you have got the derivative operator d by d r, you are going to get a phase shift of pi by 2, because from the sine you get the cosine. When the potential is not 0, you get an additional phase shift and this phase shift is obviously coming because of the potential. So, there is some information about the potential which you are going to find in this phase shift. Now, this is a topic of some detail which we will take up later in scattering theory and you will find that in quantum collision theory, you get a lot of information about the nature of the potential by looking at the phase shifts. So, the phase shift analysis is a very important tool in quantum collisions. So, this is something that we will return to at a later part. There are a few other properties that I would like to mention over here. So, this is the r tending to infinity the asymptotic form of the solution. What we do know about the bound state spectrum is that the solutions go as r to the l. As r tends to infinity, the bound state solutions go to 0 because they are bound. And then 
for the entire range it then goes as r to the l e to the minus gamma r and some other function chi. So, you can find what must be the nature of chi and when you do this which I am going to assume that you have done in your first course in, in quantum mechanics. So, I am not going to do this algebra, but I will just remind you of some of the properties that the number of nodes of the radial function when you look at this is n minus l minus 1. Okay, those are the number of zeros that the radial function will go through and this is an important property that I would like you to register. Keep track of this because it has got very important applications in spectroscopy and quantum collisions of atomic systems. So, if you look at l equal to 0 for n equal to 1 there will be no node, 2 p will be nodeless, 3 d will be nodeless right. And the number of nodes depending on what is the difference between n and l you will find that 2 s 3 p 4 d have got one node, 3 s 4 p 5 d have got one node, this has got two nodes and so on. So, without looking at the detailed form of the expression if I ask you to sketch in your notebooks sketch the 4 d wave function, can you do it now in the next 10 seconds? The 4 d, how would you do it? You know that it is a d wave, therefore, l is equal to how much is it 2 s p d right, l is equal to 2. So, it goes as r to the 2. So, the small r behavior is parabolic. So, as r tends to 0, you will draw a parabolic curve right. As r tends to infinity, you know that it must go to 0, and in between 4 d will have only one node. So, it has to go be parabolic it has to go up, cut the x axis once and only once because there is only one node and then go to 0. So, that would be the rough sketch of the 4 d and you can do this for any radial function without knowing the detailed polynomial function explicitly in front of you. Okay. So, um, this again has important consequences in photoionization and so on. So, these are the radial functions. Um, I will also like to draw your attention to the angular part, which I am not going to discuss because you have done it in your quantum mechanics course, but you know the solutions which I will run through very quickly. Uh, you are familiar with the angular equations, the phi equations on the theta equation, and I would like to ask one question over here that you have these spherical harmonics in front of you, you have met them, you have worked with them and let us take a simple case of the spherical harmonics for the p wave, the p function. For l equal to 1, m equal to 0, the p z orbital, sketch it in your notebooks, do it in the next 10 seconds. Now, you have probably drawn these diagrams a number of times, you have seen these diagrams a number of times and without looking at your answers, I suspect that many of you do not have it right. And the reason I suspect that is the following that this is the correct shape and what you must notice is that you have got from this Pythagoras theorem a cosine theta term. So, this side must be exactly a 0 cos theta, which means that this upper lobe must be a perfect circle. And my suspicion is that many of you have not sketched a perfect circle, you may have an elongated lobe. And if you had an elongated lobe, your sketch was wrong. Okay? you get it? You re realize why it must be a perfect circle? It cannot be an elongated dumbbell shaped thing. Now, what you see what the pictures that you remember are not of the radial functions, but the square of that which is the probability density. Okay? The 
plots of the wave functions and the plots of the probability densities will have to be different. So, you have to keep track of some of these details. I think I am running out of time for this class, so I am going to stop here. I thought I would mention that um, essentially we had an introduction to the SO3 and SO4 symmetry of the hydrogen atom. We looked at the some of the properties of the angular part and some of the properties of the radial part, which are of some consequences in atomic physics. Uh, the problems, uh, the problem set is an integral part of this course and you have to do the problem set number 1, which is already uploaded at this web link and the solutions are due in a few days from now. And then of course, in a later part of the unit, we will be talking about the quantum mechanics of many electron atoms, because in many electron atoms you have got the 1 over r i j term, the coulomb repulsion between pairs of electrons. So, you need what is known as the Hartree Fock self consistent field formalism to do that. So, we will get to that. So, I will uh, uh, stop here. If there are a few questions, I will be happy to take. Uh, this is a preview of what you are going to meet in the unit on self consistent fields, but I think I would not spend any time on this, because we are practically out of the time for this class. I will rather take some questions. And if there are no questions, goodbye for now, but if there are some questions, that will be nice. Look at this figure. The spherical harmonic for L equal to 1 and M equal to 0 is a cosine function, which means that theta is the polar angle. It is the polar angle of the spherical polar coordinate system with reference to the z axis. There is nothing special about the z axis, it is some direction in space. But having chosen that, you do have a polar angle, and with reference to that polar angle, the amplitude of the radial function and the amplitude of the complete wave function will be proportional to cosine of that angle. So, it will be most for theta equal to 0. How much will it be for theta equal to pi by 2? Cosine pi by 2 is 0. So, in the horizontal plane, the amplitude in the x y plane must vanish. That is what you see over here. And in between, it will change with theta as a function of theta, the function being the cosine of the angle. Right? So, there will be a scaling factor and that scaling factor is cos theta. And from simple geometry, which you did in your high school, or even kindergarten, I do not know, because you do these theorems very early these days. You know that if you have a circle, the diameter subtends an angle of 90 degrees at any point on the circumference. right? So, one side will go as sin theta, the other side will go as cosine theta. So, this side must go as cosine theta. And if that is the nature of the dependence, this has to be a circle, so that this diameter will subtend an angle of 90 degrees at the circumference. Is that clear? So, it cannot be an elongated dumbbell, it is not. Not only that, the cosine theta is positive for the upper lobe and it is negative for the lower lobe. right? So, you must put that sign, you see in this figure there is a plus sign on the upper lobe and there is a minus sign in the lower lobe and you must put that. But when you take the probability density that goes as psi star psi, right? so it goes as a square of this and then you get the cos square theta dependence, that is what gives you the elongated dumbbells. Not only that, when you do that, there will be no plus and minus sign on the upper lobe and the lower lobe, because both the lobes will be positive. The square of minus 1 is plus 1, even in atomic physics. 
you can't help it right so when you plot the probability densities you have both the upper lobe and the lower lobe are with a plus sign but when you plot the probability amplitudes it is upper lobe which has got the plus, plus sign and the lower lobe which has got a minus sign and both of these must be perfect circles and of course they have got a symmetry about the z axis so you can you know rotate this about the z axis so you get the spherical shape any other question so thank you very much